All right, so if you've if you've ever put together a computer or you've read up on this stuff at all, you know basically there's oh, there it goes. Okay, uh, there's a there's a CPU um, which has access to RAM. It's what's called RAM on your computer. So you actually have two kinds of memory on your computer. You have RAM, which is short-term access memory. Um, so if you turn your computer off, this all gets cleared. It's only it's only uh, only maintains the memory as long as there's electricity running through it. And then there's your hard drives, which is like actual memory, and that's usually in computer land referred to as storage. Um, so usually they call this memory, and they call this storage in computer land. In sort of brain land in cognitive neuroscience, uh, we call this working memory. That is this here. Um, so let me go ahead and just use a different color. So it's really, really clear. And then over here is more what we call, you know, like long-term memories. Um, so we'll do WM for working memory. And then over here, this is a uh, long-term memory. And then, and then this is sort of, this is distributed in our brain, the CPU stuff, but it's, it's, it's the idea of, um, like your attention can only really be deployed on one thing at a time. So we do have kind of a serial bottlenecked processor in our brain. So this is kind of like attention plus uh, whatever part of our brain is doing the thing uh, because attention can usually only deploy to one area of the brain. So that's, it's kind of, there's kind of some, a lot of similarities here. So anyway, today we're just gonna be talking about <clears throat> uh, working memory. And I think it's interesting because um, honestly, I didn't think it was that interesting when I was in grad school. I was like, working memory, what? And I was in a, I was in a lab where we studied the decline of working memory in older people. But working memory is very important because it's sort of like the, the blackboard or the chalkboard of your brain. So the bigger this is, the more you can do. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that this, um, helps, uh, this is a critical piece to IQ. So if you get take hits to your working memory, you're just not gonna be able to do as much. You're not gonna be able to hold as much in mind as you manipulate it or do processing on it with this part, right? And uh, and this and similarly the uh, um, just like in the computer, uh, I'm getting a new computer soon, and I slapped in a bunch of RAM in it, so I'm excited. Um, but you know, typically a computer you'll have like eight to sixteen gigs of RAM. Uh, there's some newer like laptops now coming out with thirty two gigs. Uh, you know, I, I've I've have customized computers with up to two hundred gigs, uh, which is great for like data analysis or if you do uh, video editing, graphic design, uh, if you run neural networks, things like that. Anyway, uh, but anyways, very similarly, like in your brain, if you can't hold that much in mind. You can't manipulate that much. You can't do that many uh, high IQ things. So one, let me see if I can find this here. Um, so there was, there was kind of an interesting uh, attempt to have people practice working memory and do working memory training. This was probably about like 10 years ago. Um, and it, it had some controversy because it was it failed to reproduce. Uh, but there was a there was a at least one group, maybe two, that found if you took a bunch of healthy college students and had to practice working memory tasks, um, they seemed to perform a few points higher on an IQ test. Uh, so that failed to reproduce. Basically, is the longer story of that over the years. Um, and now there's more researchers who think. Uh, it only works in certain people, so it's some sort of subpopulation effect. It's not. It's not really the. the it's not really the, the main point of today. Although I just want to tell you that there's even a more direct link. People have tried to improve this to improve IQ. Um, so the way working memory is defined in cognitive neuroscience is that. Um, it's, it's, it's actually, it's actually, we, we present you a few things to remember. We have you do something else completely different. 
and then we have you return back and recall those same things. That's actually the definition. So often in life, if I say I give you a seven digit number, you know, I can make up one, but I don't want to actually use a real number. But um, uh, if I give you a seven digit number, remember, and have you repeat it back to me, that's not really working memory. That's very like, short term memory. Working memory is actually, I have you at least do one other thing. Um, you know, I, I give you a seven digit number and then I ask you, how do you think my shoes look or something? Then I ask you to give you a seven digit number. That's That's the actual definition of working memory. And I think it's interesting because mechanistically in your brain, what's probably going on is you have some layer of cortex, say hooked up to your eyeballs. I'm just going to draw a big old eyeball here. And it's looking at the outside world. It's got a big old optic nerve going to this layer of cortex and it's processing uh, this field of whatever you're looking at, this field of vision. And you know the various layers break down the image that you're looking at and eventually say there's a circle or a, or a face or something here um the higher levels of your cortex can identify that right now these continue to feed up to even higher levels but it seems from the evidence that what's happening is your attention sort of intervenes here and rather say rather here and uh, let me make this cleaner because this is getting really sloppy. Um, so at this level, you know, you might you might do some edge detection. Doesn't really matter. But this level, you might you might do some simple shape detection. You, you can you can recognize the edge of the face. You can recognize the person's eyes, their nose, their mouth. And then at the next level, you're actually putting it together. And this is the face the face level say that actually the part of your brain that actually recognizes faces takes all these inputs. And so let me, let me, uh, <laughs> let me separate this out because it really should be cleaner. Okay. So this is all inputting in here. All this information is going in here and this, all this layer of the cortex does is take mostly recognized geometric shapes, say, and recognizes them as a face or not, or what kind of face they are, you know? And so all your, sort of face discriminations in this layer. So what attention does is comes in at this level and probably blocks further input. And that's, and that's how you, that's basically how you're having short-term memory that you're this, this area that's, that's constantly taking a new input in this case from your eyeballs, it's just having its inputs kind of blocked or suppressed so that the last thing that it saw or you thought of, or it's stored, is kind of hanging around. So it's kind of like the RAM of a computer, you know, until it gets replaced with new information. Um, so yeah, there, if you're, if you're a CS person, that's kind of how your brain works. And that's, there's some parallels there. And that's kind of how it, attention interacts with these things. Uh, that's kind of how or why you can hold a phone number in your mind or whatever you can, um, you know, if you see somebody's face and you want to remember it, um, you might have a lot less success if you start looking at a lot of other people's faces, uh, because in theory, the, the same neural regions that are, that's actually helping you hold that short term memory, uh, is getting, um, re flooded with new fresh inputs. So that's, that's sort of the kind of overview top down breakdown of how this stuff works. I feel like even in graduate classes, they never explain it this clearly because they're trying to be very technical about it, but um, this is it. And so the idea is the more uh, things you can hold in mind, uh, the be better you can, uh, you can do with it. So like one of the oldest definitions of IQ, for instance, is, uh, oh, I see, I didn't have the window selected. IQ equals memory plus reasoning. Okay. And the memory part isn't really referring to long-term memory. It's actually in this case, referring to, um, working memory or it's, which is in the word, right? Working memory, the memory, you, the, um, to do things. And the bigger this is, the bigger your chalkboard of your mind is the more you can hold on to your, um, and manipulate in that 
kind of internal simulation in your head. And, and then the reasoning part is sort of a separate part. It's probably more related to say the CPU part, um, your ability to recognize patterns, uh, how, like for instance, if you're doing a face task, how experienced is your face area? Are you a, are you a child? Are you a newborn? Are you an adult that's seen 20,000, a hundred thousand faces in your life? Um, are you somebody who is an expert in facial detection? So you've broken down what makes up a face visually and, and, you know, you have a lot of training, um, that will all help pattern recognition, which all kind of falls into this bucket, which is the, the processing pattern recognition or in the old definition, the reasoning part. So that's kind of why it's important. Um, yeah, maybe I should have wrote, said that first, but the last thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to see if I can find that paper because it's kind of funny and then we'll just go ahead and, and oops, uh, too many chords. Uh, we'll go ahead and, um, end this little, the little, um, topic part for today. Uh, working memory paper.